The history of slavery is a sad reminder of how people can be very mean and treat others very badly. In America, slavery was deeply rooted from the early days when the country was first formed until the time, right before the Civil War. During this time, African people and their children were made to work very hard, got hurt, and were treated badly in many different ways. The word antebellum comes from Latin, where anti means before and bellum means war. In American history, the antebellum era means the time before the Civil War. This period started after the 18th century and lasted until the Civil War began in 1861. The antebellum era is a name used to describe this time because it shows how society, the economy, and politics were different during this time and how those differences led to the Civil War. This period in American history saw a lot of growth and change. The country was becoming more industrial, and people were moving westward. There were also many arguments about slavery, which was a big part of life in the antebellum South. In this region, slavery was common, and people believed in it. Over time, Southern leaders changed their view of slavery from something they were embarrassed about to something they thought was good. They criticized the abolitionist movement, a group that wanted to end slavery. The demand for slave labor and the ban on bringing in more slaves from Africa made the price of slaves go up. This made it profitable for smaller farms, especially in places like Virginia, to sell their slaves to other southern states. Most southern farmers had small to medium-sized farms with just a few slaves. But the big plantation owners had a lot of slaves, and this gave them power and respect. During the antebellum era, the country had a lot of problems, like arguments about states' rights, whether slavery should be allowed in new places, and disagreements between the North and the South. All of these problems eventually led to the Civil War, which had a big and long-lasting impact on the United States. While we have a lot of evidence about how badly slaves were treated, there is also some evidence of sexual relationships between white slave owners and black women. Sometimes these relationships were forced, but other times they seemed more like a partnership. What's less well known is that black male slaves also suffered abuse from white women who were considered to be in the elite or upper class. This article talks about a specific group of women known as the planter class white women. These women belonged to the wealthy plantation owners in the southern United States before the Civil War. They mainly focused on growing valuable crops like cotton, tobacco, and rice and heavily relied on slave labor. The wealthy plantation owners were called the planter class and their wives, who held privileged positions in society, were the planter-class white women. This video explores the often forgotten history of how black male slaves were mistreated by these planter-class white women. It looks at the reasons behind sexual encounters between them, the power dynamics at play, and the issue of consent. The video also shows how these upper-class white women used sex as a way to maintain white supremacy and male dominance during that time. Before we dive into this topic, Please like, share, and subscribe to our content. Sit back and enjoy as we uncover the lesser-known story of planter-class white women and the abuse suffered by black male slaves at their hands. Now, let's explore the intersection of power and gender within this context. In the past, slavery didn't only involve the oppression of people based on their race, it also reinforced gender inequalities. This affected the planter-class white women as well. In the time before the American Civil War, in the southern part of the United States, there were certain rules and expectations for women. These rules said that women should act in a certain way, like being gentle and polite. But, even though these rules existed, women still had a lot of power, especially when it came to the system of slavery. White women in the antebellum South played important roles in keeping the system of slavery going. They had authority, which means they had the power to make decisions and give orders. This authority extended to how enslaved people, including black men, were treated and managed, both in their homes and on plantations. It's interesting to note that during this time, white women couldn't vote, and they couldn't hold official positions in government. When they got married, their property legally belonged to their husbands. However, there was one thing they could do just like white men. They could buy, sell, and own enslaved people, in a book called They Were Her Property by Stephanie Jones Rogers. The author argues that white women weren't just passive onlookers in the slavery business, as some historians have thought. Instead, they actively took part in it and used it to strengthen their economic power. In the past, historians often based their ideas about the role of white women in slavery on the writings of a small group of white women from the South. But Jones Rogers, 
who is a history professor at the University of California, Berkeley, used a different source this time. She looked at interviews with formerly enslaved people that were done during the Great Depression. These interviews were part of a project by the government, called the Federal Writers Project, which was part of the Works Progress Administration. In these interviews, Jones Rogers found evidence that white girls were trained from a very young age in how to own and manage enslaved people. Some were even given enslaved individuals as gifts when they were as young as nine months old. White parents who owned enslaved people taught their daughters how to be slave owners, giving them lessons on how to discipline and manage enslaved people. Some even allowed their daughters to punish enslaved people physically. So, in the antebellum South, even though there were expectations for how women should behave, white women had significant power within the system of slavery, and they actively participated in it, using it to strengthen their own economic position. Jones Rogers reveals that in the past, some parents and family members who owned slaves would give enslaved people as gifts to young girls during Christmas or on their first birthdays. There are even stories of white families giving enslaved individuals to newborn white baby girls. In a particular court record, a woman shared her own experience. When her grandfather gave her an enslaved person as her property when she was just nine months old, it's quite puzzling to think about how a nine-month-old baby could comprehend ownership of another human being without being informed. Evidently, these young children were raised in an environment where they were taught to believe that they had authority over someone, essentially making them owners of a human being. As a poet and writer mentioned in the book They Were Her Property by Jones Rogers, these early experiences had a profound impact on these children. They grew up without recognizing black slaves as fellow human beings which played a significant role in shaping their beliefs. This upbringing contributed to the development of racist and supremacist attitudes in society. It's a problematic mindset that needs to be examined and transformed, fostering a new perspective where everyone is seen and treated as equals. One distressing aspect of the abuse suffered by black male slaves at the hands of elite white women was sexual exploitation. While the prevailing narrative often portrays white women as passive or innocent, there were instances where they actively engaged in non-consensual sexual relationships and rape with black male slaves. These actions were a result of their power and control over the enslaved individuals, perpetuating a cycle of sexual violence and further dehumanizing those who were already enslaved. For instance, in the autobiography Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl by Harriet Jacobs, who herself was once a slave. She detailed how the daughters of plantation owners would exploit and take advantage of male slaves for their own sexual gratification. These historical accounts shed light on the deeply troubling practices of the past, which contributed to the perpetuation of racism and inequality in society. It is essential to revisit and challenge these historical mindsets to create a more equitable and just society where everyone is treated with dignity and respect regardless of their background or race. These women knew that the female slaves were under the authority of their fathers in everything. In some cases, they even held authority over the male slaves. I once witnessed a household where the master, filled with shame, had to endure the fact that his daughter had chosen one of the least respected slaves on his plantation to father her first grandchild. She didn't make her advances towards her equals or the more intelligent servants in her father's employ. Instead, she picked the most brutalized one, someone she could dominate without fearing exposure. The author here is describing a disturbing type of behavior, clearly showing sexual predation. Harriet Jacobs also confirms that such acts were not uncommon, and they cannot be considered consensual in any meaningful way. This behavior amounts to sexual abuse, if not outright rape, plantation mistresses and elite women, like their male counterparts, had the power to sexually control and abuse their slaves. Another way in which white women from the planter class exercised sexual control over slaves was threatening to accuse them of rape or attempted rape if they refused sexual advances. They exploited the idea that they were weak and in need of protection from white men, thus asserting control over black male slaves. The reasons behind these women's sexual exploitation of slaves probably varied. Some may have been bored or sexually frustrated, but on a deeper level. It could have been a way to compensate for their lack of power in other aspects of their lives. Plantation class women were often considered the property of their husbands, with limited sexual agency compared to men. Exploiting slaves sexually might have given them a sense of power. This is not meant to excuse their actions, 
nor to suggest that women with higher social status wouldn't have engaged in such abuse. However, just as white slave owners expressed their frustrations through cruelty and violence, they likely used sex as a means of domination and control in a society where they felt relatively powerless. Their freedom and mobility were restricted, they often needed a male chaperone for travel, and spousal abuse was deemed acceptable for men to control their wives during the antebellum era. Many plantation women were unhappy with their lack of freedom and societal expectations in private. The women who remained loyal, obedient, pleasant, and cheerful while their husbands engaged in extramarital affairs with or sexually abused female slaves, all while knowing that the mixed race slave children around them were their husband's offspring, experienced a deeply humiliating and heart-wrenching situation. Historian Catherine Clinton offers this perspective. If plantation mistresses could maintain a reputation beyond reproach, their husbands, fathers, sons, and brothers could boast about the superiority of their civilization. Clinton goes further to describe them as prisoners in disguise. Southern women who often married at a younger age than their northern counterparts. Frequently as young as 14 or 15 years old, they were often left alone on plantations while their husbands traveled for business, pleasure, or military duty. The life of a plantation mistress was often characterized by loneliness and sadness. Physical abuse deeply associated with the institution of slavery was primarily prevalent in the South and took on various forms. African Americans were enslaved on small farms, large plantations in cities, towns, inside homes, and in the fields, as well as within various industries and transportation sectors. Although the manifestations of slavery varied, the fundamental concept remained consistent. Slaves were treated as property solely because of their race, particularly because they were black. The enforcement of their status as property often involved the threat or use of violence. Both black and white people coexisted within these harsh parameters, and their interactions took on various forms. Physical violence was not limited to white male slaveholders. White women also engaged in acts of brutality against black male slaves. These acts ranged from whipping and beating to inflicting other forms of corporal punishment, which left enduring physical and psychological scars. A striking example of the extreme brutality faced by black male and female slaves is the infamous story of Madame Marie Delphine Lalori. She subjected her slaves to horrific abuse, including gouging their eyes out, punching holes in their heads, and leaving their wounds to fester with maggots. If you doubt the veracity of these accounts, you should prepare yourself for the shocking details about this 19th century slave owner's unspeakable cruelty. Madame Marie Delphine Lalori. In the mansion at Royal Street, situated in the heart of the French Quarter of New Orleans, Louisiana, a horrifying incident unfolded. A fierce fire suddenly erupted, sending shockwaves through the neighborhood. In a remarkable display of community spirit, the neighbors rushed to the scene, ready to assist by dousing the flames with water and helping the endangered family evacuate. However, as they arrived at the scene, a strange and unsettling sight met their eyes. By the standards of the elite Southern society of that century, it was an extraordinary and unsettling revelation. The lady of the house seemed more concerned with saving her precious jewels and furs than seeking the aid of her enslaved workers. This alone was baffling, for a mansion without slaves was in and heard of rarity. When inquiries were made about the whereabouts of her servants, the woman of the house curtly replied that it was none of anyone's concern. Some considered this response mysterious enough while others claimed to have heard faint moans and screams emanating from the attic. Fueled by curiosity and concern, a brave group decided to venture into the mansion to locate the missing slaves. However, upon opening the door to the attic, they were met with an appalling and nauseating stench that stopped them dead in their tracks. The sight that unfolded before them was beyond any human imagination a gruesome and nightmarish. It was a chamber of unspeakable horror, a twisted manifestation of sheer madness. In this grotesque room, they found the remains of the missing slaves a shocking testimony to the sadistic acts of Madame Marie Delphine Lalori. She would subsequently be ranked as one of the most infamous serial killers in history, alongside notorious figures like the blood-drinking Countess Elizabeth Bathory from 17th century, Hungary. The suspicions of the neighbors had been horrifically confirmed. The reason behind the disappearance of all of Lalori's slaves was now laid bare for the world to witness it was a relentless and barbaric savagery. The room contained piles of lifeless bodies, organs, and limbs. 
Slaves were strapped to tables or confined within cramped cages, their bodies contorted in agony. Metal bars with cruel spikes were wrapped around their necks to prevent movement. While some were placed in smaller cages, their bones broken and reset to fit into grotesque, living deformities, their eyes were gouged, fingernails torn, ears hanging by shreds of skin, and mouths filled with unspeakable horrors. Some had their skin peeled off in spirals resembling caterpillars, while others were made to look like crabs with their fractured and reset bones. One unfortunate victim had their intestines torn out and knotted around their waist. These atrocities were inflicted on numerous helpless souls, each bearing the scars of their unimaginable suffering. Some people said that there were possibly up to a hundred individuals who were believed to still be alive but in a terrible state, suffering from extreme neglect and starvation. It was widely believed that no one had ever endured such harsh mistreatment as Madame LaLaurie's slaves. Legend has it that a young slave, who worked as a cook and had been chained to a stove in LaLaurie's kitchen, started a fire while being interrogated. This young woman confessed that she had ignited the fire as a desperate attempt to end her own life rather than face the torture inflicted by Madame LaLaurie. LaLaurie had previously threatened to take her to a room on the top floor and those who had been taken to this upper room never returned. Upon learning of the cook's revelation, an investigation was launched into the claims, and it was confirmed that the top room was a living nightmare for any slave unfortunate enough to end up there. Madame LaLaurie, whose maiden name was Marie Delphine McCarty, was born on a day in March in the then Spanish-ruled New Orleans. Most of LaLaurie's life did not display any cruelty or evil tendencies, despite rumors suggesting that slaves had killed her parents. She enjoyed a relatively normal and privileged life and was a respected figure in New Orleans High Society, known for her kindness, gentleness, and courtesy. Her father, Louis Bartholomew D. McCarty, originally known as Chevalier D. McCarthy, brought the family to New Orleans from Ireland during the French colonial period, around the year. Her mother, Marie-Jean Larabla, also known as the Widow Lecomte, married Louis B. McCarty as her second husband. Both of Delphine's parents were prominent members of the town's European Creole community. Her uncle by marriage, Esteban Rodriguez Muro, served as the governor of the Spanish American provinces of Louisiana and Florida from insert years, and her cousin Augustin D. McCarty held the position of mayor of New Orleans. LaLaurie had three marriages, and she had five children whom she cared for very lovingly. Her first husband was a Spanish man named Don Ramon de Lopez Angulo who held a high-ranking position as a Caballero de la Royal de Carlos, a Spanish officer. They had one child together, a daughter, but Don Ramon tragically passed away in Havana while on his way to Madrid, just four years after their marriage. Following Don Raymond's death, Delphine married again, this time to a Frenchman named Jean Blanc. Blanc was a banker, lawyer, and legislator and was almost as affluent in the community as Delphine's own family. Together, they had four children, three daughters, and a son. Sadly, Jean Blanc also passed away. Delphine's third and final marriage was to a much younger doctor named Leonard Louis Nicolas Lalaurie. Madame Lalaurie acquired a three-story mansion on Royal Street in the French Quarter, which was a common practice among high-society women at that time. Like many wealthy individuals of her time, Madame Lalaurie owned slaves. Accounts of how she treated her slaves during a specific period remain mixed. Some sources, such as Harriet Martino, writing in a certain year, claimed that LaLaurie's slaves appeared to be in poor and miserable conditions. However, in public, Madame LaLaurie was generally polite to black people and seemed concerned about the health of her enslaved individuals. On two occasions, she even emancipated two of her slaves, as documented in court records. Records from a certain year to another revealed the deaths of numerous slaves at the Royal Street mansion although the causes of their deaths were not mentioned. Widespread rumors about LaLaurie's mistreatment of her slaves prompted a local lawyer to visit her and remind her of the laws governing slave treatment. During this visit, no evidence of wrongdoing or mistreatment was found. However, after the lawyer's visit, one of LaLaurie's neighbors reported witnessing a horrifying incident in which a young slave girl fell to her death from the roof of the Royal Street Mansion while attempting to escape punishment from a whip-wielding Madame LaLaurie. There are two credible reports of individuals choosing death over facing Madame LaLaurie's torture, one involving a man who threw himself out of a third-story window out of fear of a punishment. The other tragic incident involved a 12-year-old slave girl named Leah, occurring in the year 
Leah, as the story goes, was brushing Madame LaLaurie's hair, and she accidentally pulled a bit too hard, making LaLaurie very angry. The mistress, in a fit of rage, chased the young slave girl with a whip. Tragically, the pursuit led to Leah falling off the roof of the house resulting in her death. This incident prompted an investigation into the LaLaurie family, and they were found guilty of cruel and illegal treatment. Leah's lifeless body was discovered hidden in a well, thanks to witnesses who had seen LaLaurie bury the girl. As a consequence, LaLaurie was fined $300 by the authorities, and she was forced to relinquish nine enslaved people from her household. These nine individuals were later reacquired by the Lalaurus through a relative acting as an intermediary and brought back to the Royal Street Mansion, where they continued to suffer under Lalaurie's cruelty. This torment endured until the night when a fire broke out on the 10th day of April. Marie Delphine Lalaurie and her husband fled by boat, leaving their butler, who had also participated in the abuse, to face the fury of the crowd that had stormed into their mansion, driven by the sheer evil they had witnessed. Some historians have suggested that perhaps the traumatic experiences of her family's death during the Haitian rebellion had awakened a dark and malevolent side within Lalori. However, this is by no means an excuse for the heinous acts she committed. Despite never facing formal charges, Lalori's reputation in upper-class society was utterly tarnished. It is believed that she passed away in Paris in December. Exploring the abuse of black male slaves by white women uncovers a disturbing aspect of history, often overlooked or intentionally silenced. By acknowledging these historical injustices, we challenge the conventional narrative surrounding slavery and deepen our understanding of the complex power dynamics at play. It's an important step toward building a more inclusive and equitable future. We appreciate your engagement with this content and encourage you to share your thoughts in the comment section. Stay tuned for more extensive discussions on the abuse of black male slaves in the antebellum era. Thank you for your support. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to stay connected with our channel. You're part of our family, and we're grateful for your ongoing support. See you soon.